Hello, I'm Nadia Bilchik, and I am joined by three Doctors B, Dr. Bamberg, Dr. Bilchik, and Dr. Bilchik. Tan, you made it. I'm so excited. Yeah, and hi. Anton Vilchik and Dr. Wendy Bamberg. Dr. Wendy Bamberg is an epidemiologist. Dr. Anton Vilchik is a cancer surgeon. And Dr. Tanya Bilchik is a neurologist. And Wendy, we'll start off with you, seeing you are joining the doctors Vilchik <laughs> this evening. And as an epidemiologist, when you heard that there was a vaccine, what was your first response? And help us understand the ramifications. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, very uh, happy to join you tonight. So it was definitely exciting news when we heard from Pfizer that it might be up to 90% uh, efficacious, which is just absolutely wonderful. But it's really important to know that this is an interim analysis, which means that partway through the study, they look at the numbers and look at, and look at the data. And so what we know right now is they're partway through the study. It looks like it's about 90% 90, 90 efficacious so far, but they do need additional analysis when they get to the end of the study. They need additional experts to look at the data and make sure that it looks right. They also need to look at other things. So in, in this particular study, they're looking specifically for uh, symptomatic uh, people who have COVID, but they haven't analyzed the data for people who don't have symptoms with COVID and for various populations that might be at risk. Um, and so those things are going to need to be looked at also. But right now it's promising and we're cro all crossing our fingers. Thank you so much. And you had to be a Dr. B to join us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tanya Bilchik, you're at Yale and right. you are practicing medicine in the area of headaches. Are you seeing any difference? Have things changed? Are patients coming in? I'm seeing more stress-related headache or people that are spending a lot of time on screen and that seems to be triggering more headaches. So I think it's kind of a combination of COVID fatigue, screen time and more time at the computer and also wearing the PPE. Now everybody has to, at least in my clinic, we need to wear face masks, obviously, and now we're wearing um, face shields as well. And not all of them are as comfortable as others. So I think that that causes pressure on the temples, which is triggering more headache. Hmm. And Anton Bilchik, who is a surgical oncologist. Yeah, so I um, just finished a pretty busy uh, cancer clinic and uh, there clearly um, is a mixture of emotions. Um, some patients are encouraged by the thought of a vaccine. I think there's definite, um, uh, there's definite COVID fatigue. Um, some patients have just had enough and want to just get on with their lives. Um, I've had uh, several patients today who actually want to delay their operations, not so much for for COVID, but more because they want to enjoy Thanksgiving and they want to enjoy Christmas mm -hmm. um, because they just feel like this has been such a tough year and it's quite a, quite difficult in a way for me to um, tell them that they need to have a cancer operation done now for fear of the cancer growing versus, you know what, you've really had a tough year. This has been 2020. Why don't you enjoy um, your Thanksgiving, enjoy your Christmas with your family, do it safely. Mm. So I, I had quite a um, tough day today in trying to reconcile the two. Hmm. Now, one thing Dr. Bamberg has been doing is she has a consultancy for film sets and she has been helping people navigate the COVID in having a safe workspace. So Wendy, take us through that and how you are keeping movie sets safe. Yeah, so I've been um, really privileged to be able to work uh, not just with film production companies, but actually a variety of different types of partners, including nonprofits and schools and healthcare settings, um, office spaces, uh, outdoor adventure companies. There's been a variety of, of folks I've been able to work with. And it's been, it's been very interesting, right? Because we all need to follow the same sorts of prevention in order to uh, decrease the risk of transmission in our work settings. But each setting is very unique. And even across 
different film productions or from office to office, you know, each individual business has their own needs and trying to figure out how to take these very general protocols and apply them across business settings has been um, quite a challenge, but it's been great because I've had the opportunity to learn so much from, from these partners. It's been really great. So I like to ask all of you this advice and guidance right now. And Wendy, we'll come back to you on this one. What are you saying to people right now in terms of, yes, there may be a vaccine, but what do we need to be doing over the next two weeks? Well, I'll start. Um, you know, the, the students are going back home for Thanksgiving, so that's going to be a little more complicated. I was in the student clinic today and um, that's one of our concerns is people taking a Thanksgiving break, going home and then coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, the one wonderful thing is that all the students are being tested regularly once a week, those that are living in the dorms, those that are living off campus. I will tell you that I was working with some of the neurology residents and some of the primary care residents earlier in the week and they have been requested at least to be kind of on standby for COVID wards. Our numbers are coming up. Mm. And so I think for Thanksgiving, everybody should limit, at least in the state of Connecticut, we're limited to 10 people at home. You know, stay away from restaurants, stay away from social gatherings, don't get together with too many people, don't get any indoor spaces, all the guidelines that have been put forth by the governor and, um, you know, I think what's going to be concerning is when everybody gets back mm -hmm. from Thanksgiving and, and uh, Christmas breaks. And with luck, we have a vaccine sometime next year. Um, Wendy, for you, advice, guidance. I know you are supervising a lot of businesses, organizations, movie sets in this area. What are you saying to them? Yeah, and so I think it's not just for business settings, but, um, you know, really across the board, and I've been watching uh, what other epidemiologists are, are saying as well. And I think we're all extremely concerned by what we're seeing. Um, you know, we're seeing all time highs for cases and hospitalizations across the US right now. Um, yesterday, we had over 1100 deaths. Um, there's been a 54,000 case increase in, across the US in the last two weeks, as far as the total number of cases that we're seeing per day. This is really huge, really unprecedented. The slope of the curves is is just you know out of control. And so we're very, very concerned, especially with the holidays coming up. Um, so the ideal scenario, and this is very difficult for people, is really to have celebrations with your immediate household only. Um, there are some circumstances, obviously mental health plays a big role mm. in this, and it's, it's very difficult to balance those things. But be, the best thing you can do is have Thanksgiving with your immediate household. And if you have reasons why you need to gather with others, limit those gatherings, be outside. Um, if you can't make sure that the ventilation is very good, people are wearing masks, you're more than six feet apart. Uh, when the masks come off and you're eating. And, and again, preferably that's outside. Um, but people need to be very, very careful because I think we're all very concerned of what we're gonna see with the caseload and followed by hospitalizations and followed by deaths following Thanksgiving and the holidays. And so on advice and guidance from you. Yeah, um, I have to say that I feel like um, we're living in a little bit of a bubble because in in our um, hospital, the, the Los the Angeles, in Los Angeles, the, the number is actually pretty low, and hmm. our our hospital is just functioning normally. The emergency room is fine. Our our intensive care unit is managing. We're doing all all, all of our um, elective surgeries. So. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we, we, we look at the news, but it seems different. Um, and, and, and clearly, you know, this is, you know, region specific, city specific, but, um, you know, we're just not seeing in, in, in our, um, you know, in, in our hospital, um, what, what others are seeing. I have to um, just mention one other thing, and I'm very interested in, in Dr. Bamberg's response. Our, our governor, Governor of California, just announced a short time ago that he, he's discouraging all Californians from leaving California for anything recreational, and that if um, anyone travels for any reason, they should quarantine 
for, for two weeks, but it's kind of a, a it's somewhat vague because, um, uh, you know, and, and non-specific because it's not clear as to how and if um, the quarantine is going to be monitored. Um, if people uh, leave to go uh, visit family, how is anyone going to know whether it's recreation versus business versus some other reason? So clearly there's some concern um, in this message from the governor, but how are we supposed to interpret that? Hmm. Dr. Bamberg. Yeah, that is, um, I think it is very challenging um, to really understand, interpret, and implement some public health orders and executive orders that come out, um, you know, in various parts of the country, not just California. Um, and, you know, even those of us who are staring at this stuff every day sometimes have difficulty trying to interpret and really see how to implement it. Um, you know, my my view on the, the issue of travel is that, you know, any anytime you're moving about, out, you are potentially increasing the risk that you're going to come in contact with someone that has COVID, right, and, and potentially increase the transmission. Um, for travel, it really depends on your behavior while you're traveling and what the circumstances are, right? And so you could have somebody in your immediate locale who is not wearing a mask, not being very careful, having parties, gatherings, who might be very much more at risk of transmission under those circumstances than someone who's being very, very careful as they travel. So I think there's a balance there that's very um, difficult. Uh, one thing about, you know, California is one of the places that doesn't quite look as bad as some other uh, states right now. And so I don't know if part of the concern is the possibility of if you are going elsewhere, you're going from a low region um, to a region that has higher transmission, um, there may be some concern uh, with that and actually bringing it back with folks to California. That might be one concern. Um, so some of these, these types of orders I've seen in states that have lower rates and they will implement quarantines for other states that have higher rates. And certainly people should understand if they're traveling what those rates are, where they're going, uh, what the risk it might be uh, for, for contracting COVID. And if they are engaging in higher risk activities, that's that's a point where I think having a quarantine uh, makes sense. So, yes, I, yeah. I have a, a follow-up question to that because what I'm looking at, and this is from JAMA, which is the journal American Medical Association, one of the, the, the most prestigious journals, and it, it just came out and it says the risk of COVID-19 during air travel, the risk of contracting um, COVID-19 during air travel is lower than from an office building, classroom, supermarket, or commuter train. Hmm. Um, yeah, what, and that's what, interesting. What do you make of this, this article that I'm, I'm reading? And for full transparency, I am getting on a plane tomorrow. So I'm going, so, I'm like listening so, to all of you and going, do I cancel all travel? Thank you. So, yeah, be careful what I say. Yeah, so um, I would say uh, for that, um, I haven't read that particular study. So just as a ballpark, I've heard a figure of about 4,000 publications that come out on COVID every week. Um, but it is one study that I will definitely uh, definitely look at. One of, the, one of the things, I was actually on a recent call um, with a bunch of uh, uh, epidemiology physicians and they were talking about air travel. And one of the reasons why the actual plane flight might not be um, quite as much risk as other types of situations is because of the circulation on the airplane. Right. And the figure that was cited was um, that the, the ventilation on an airplane is 35 times more than what you get in an operating room, which was very interesting to me. I hadn't heard that before. So I'll, I'll definitely read that JAMA study um, with some interest, but that might be part uh, of the reason why it might not be quite as much of a risk, knowing that when you are on a plane with other people, anytime you're in a gathering with other people, there is still some risk inherent in that. Tanya, would you get on a plane? Um, yeah, probably would. Again, that with- mask. With um, probably a face shield or glasses or something, but I think it also depends on where you're traveling. I mean, Connecticut was absolutely fine until a month ago, and suddenly our numbers are gradually escalating. We were really good. We had a horrible uh, April and May, and then June the numbers started to come down, and now they're creeping up again. And it's kind of very interesting to see because 
we were really low. We're coming up. We're gradually increasing. And I think that's kind of the concerning part is you may be low now, but who knows what's going to happen in three weeks' time. Well, that's just the unknown. So, uh, Wendy, is there any specific mask? And then Anton and Tanya, I'd like to know, is there something we should know? You know, they speak of the KN95 and the 95. What does Dr. Wendy Bamberg, Dr. Anton Bilchik and Tanya Bilchik do to stay safe? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So CDC actually had a wonderful guidance document that just came out uh, looking at the efficacy of face coverings and cloth face coverings, which was excellent. I had been waiting for this for a while. And, um, you know, it, it seems that uh, a cloth face covering that has several layers to it. Okay. Um, and which is really important, right? Nothing that has a valve on it. You know, you'll see the, the face covering yes, yes, of the valve. Yes, yes that does nothing for the people around you. You're basically, you know, blowing out all of your air through that valve. So that's not a good option for a cloth face covering. Um, I did hear actually, and I can't remember where I heard this yesterday, that if you hold the, the cloth face covering up to the light and you can see the light streaming through it, it might mean that the weave of the fabric is not tight enough and you might opt for a different mask where you can't see the light as much. That That's another guidance piece for, for choosing a cloth face covering. Um, they they said CDC said in this document that they think that uh, masks can potentially uh, decrease uh, transmission by about seventy to eighty percent is the ballpark, which is tremendously helpful and and very very promising and and really emphasizes the importance of wearing uh, face coverings, cloth face coverings, or masks when you have a, a medical grade. So the same type of mask. What kind you just head on now? Did exactly. Yeah, yeah the disposable mask. Yep, yeah. that can actually increase the efficacy even more. And an N95 obviously is the gold standard, but those are the types of masks that we really want to see in hospitals. The medical grade surgical masks and N95 masks. We want to make sure the healthcare workers and other essential workers who really need those pieces of PPE are able to get those because they need them. And they're also really uncomfortable. Oh, Anton, yeah. and that's something, Anton, that you've been saying since the beginning of these conversations is if you can get yeah. used to wearing a mask in surgery, we all can. How, I mean, there was a point at which, and you had actual marks on yeah. your nose and bruising, yeah. has that lessened? Yeah, yeah I, you know, so the, the N95 is what's recommended in the operating room. Um, it's extremely uncomfortable. I mean, there, there, there've been, you know, pictures from nurses and, um, medical personnel from around the country with literally, you know, tears and abraded skin, and because the whole idea is that you want it to fit. It's called the fit test. You want you want it to fit in such a way that there's no leakage around it. But it's it feels, you know, a little bit suffocating. It's and and it, it literally after a long period of time just starts tearing into your skin. Um, but uh, you know, I think that most people are are, are willing to deal with a. A, a small abrasion or some discomfort on their face to to protect themselves. Um, I, I, what, what I'm seeing among um, a lot of surgeons, though, is uh, that they're they've you know because patients are being COVID tested for every single procedure. Uh, many surgeons are just are, are using the the surgical masks um, r rather than the, the than the the N95s. Not not every surgeon is is wearing an N95. But I, I just, you know, th there was something on the news, I think it was today or yesterday, which I found very um, interesting and somewhat amusing, that someone has just come out with this, you know, very high-end, you know, $1,500 mask. With mm -hmm. and did, you, did you hear about that? I think it's it's so interesting to see how the <laughs> the market has changed and now, you know, masks are in and now let's It's going to be a fashion through. item. Since this is not going away for probably, what, another year at least, that we may as well get fashionable about it, and, and so now now we see these high end um, clothing companies, and I believe there's one mask now that's being sold for fifteen hundred dollars. Um, Why so don't you have one to show us? Our next conversation, you will have one to show us, please. So, and we're going to wrap up with what in one sentence or two would you like to say to your patients? Starting with you, Anton. What do you say to your patients right now? Um, the same. Thing that I've been saying for really the last six months that this is not going away, um, that we need to live our lives safely and just 
three things that we hear again and again, social distancing, masks, and stay away from crowds. Tan, you adding yours, what are you saying to your patients? I go the same story, wear your mask, wash your hands, be careful, avoid big crowds, unfortunately. Yes, that's why big classrooms, big social gatherings. Because. That's why, Wendy, our family is seeing each other on Zoom. Dr. Wendy Bamberg, last for your patients and all the people you are taking care of. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the news for the vaccine is, is promising for the future. Um, we are still going to see masks in place for a while, even after the vaccine comes out for, for quite a while afterwards. Keep wearing your mask all the time when you're with others that are outside of your household. Um, please keep your distance at least six feet away. Avoid crowds, absolutely 100% agree with that. Wash your hands and even small gatherings such as gathering with one other household, we're seeing this be a major piece of transmission. So we really need to avoid that right now, unfortunately, which makes it very difficult. Well, well, I hope, one, one yes, one, please. Really, really, um, I've been doing to, you know, all my, my patients. So um, many patients come in with their eyeglasses. Yes. The mask. Yes. And then their glasses are fogging up. Correct. And there's a very simple thing to do is you just take a little bit of tape and just put it over here. This is what we do in the operating room, just a little bit of clear tape. Okay. And... You know, patients are so happy because they can see and wear a mask at the same time and not fog up. So just I've a, got a good that, idea, that, clear that, tape. That tape will abrade your skin. You can just get some soft, soft tape just to put over here. Oh, so not this soft, clear no. tape, soft surgical just, tape. Yeah, yeah just, exactly. And it makes the world of difference. And it's so funny to see patients who can't see and they suddenly go, oh, my gosh, I can see and I can wear a mask. But it's really important because people end up doing this and this and this and this and this. So, Absolutely. So Can just I add one simple... caveat? When people, yes, are exercising, when people are exercising at the gym, wearing a mask does not affect the amount of oxygen you're bringing in. There have been a number of studies that show that. Wear your mask That's if you're you know. Please. Thank you. That's good to know. It's interesting because I do wear my mask when I go to the gym. There are not a lot of people there. I do social distance. Dr. Bamberg would probably say don't go to the gym, but it's like, you know, what's the lesser of two evil? But it's surprising how many people aren't wearing a mask. So thank you. And also don't drink your hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> but please drink because whatever it takes to get us through this, you know, Wendy, we've been saying you might emerge as a in a funk a drunk or a chunk, we're seeing that too. Oh, the lighter side, but the lighter side of a very serious business. So I am just delighted and thank you so much to the three Dr. Bs, Dr. Bamberg, Dr. Bilchik and Dr. Bilchik and to Dr. Brian Bilchik. We missed you, we did. And Wendy, I tell everybody that what happens after this is my mother in South Africa gets to see the recording the next day and she gives us a full critique on what we did well and how we looked and was our lighting okay and how was our camera lens. So one thing I think she'll be delighted by having you join us. Any last thoughts, doctors Anton Tanya or Dr. Wendy Bamberg, as we end our Friday evening broadcast, stay safe and stay sane, right? And one more, I my daughter is watching in Tel Aviv. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen, to those in Tel Aviv and Dr. Wendy Bamberg's children are there, right? They're, yes, they're upstairs, yes. And that's, uh, you know, that's our whole other discussion. How do you stay sane with teenagers? Anton's kids don't live at home, mine, but Tan, you've got one in. So Jen, and to all the family and friends around the world and the country who are watching us, all we can say is we hope to see you in person sooner rather than later. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.